getting disturbed by noise because she can basically hear and see. So she can see me through the camera and hear me through the microphone. And if it's a keypad, you touch keys, that's the equivalent of touch, or if it can be a touch screen as well. And so, you know, why are we building a, a digital baby? And so the term artificial intelligence is actually really um, quite loosely used. A lot of times it's really talking about you know, machine learning or pattern recognition. And what we're really building is cognitive architectures. We're trying to ultimately build a machine which you can teach and it can think and it can do actions by itself. And so the purposes of this is you can make autonomous characters for games, but you can also make smart virtual assistants which can actually really help you. So we're looking at a lot at the future of human-computer interaction and what's that going to really involve. So if you think about um, the ease of interacting with another person to cooperate on a task. Like if you're trying to do a shared goal, you'll look at what each other's doing, you'll watch the progress of some goal and you'll interact together. So we're trying to build all the elements to basically create a cooperative inter interaction with machines. And, but we interact with humans and we do this very naturally and we've done it for millennia, you know, thousands of millennia. And so it's really a, um, a, uh, a, a thing where we're looking at the core core foundations and uh, looking holistically at intelligence. So for example, emotion is actually a key part of intelligence. So basically, you know, a computer algorithm, algorithm could get stuck on something, whereas if a human got stuck on something, they'd get frustrated and then they'd just go screw it and move on to something else. And really that's the function of emotion. It's really sort of reducing the dimensionality of how you interact with the world. So basically what we're doing is essentially building a, a toy version of a, of a digital human. So um, you know, this is baby X here. We can sort of zoom up. She's kind of stirring. I'll, I'll, I'll wake her up here. So hey, sweetheart. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hey. Hey, let's zoom out. Now, I'm, the reason I'm speaking to her like that is she's actually listening to me. She's just wondering, how are you? Hey, ooh, yeah, let's zoom out and see, sort of get a, get a different view of her. So, so basically, now, let's, hey, aren't you excited to be at AI Day? Ooh, yeah, isn't that exciting? Wow, yeah, ooh, ooh, yeah. So the more sort of fun we've had, and then we take a look at what she's actually seeing. So let's actually see what she's looking at. So over here, you can see she's getting, looking at me over here. If I wave my hand over here, I'm getting her attention. So she's looking. So... All of her behavior is driven for a reason. It's all synthesized live on the fly by neural networks. So there's no motion capture driving things here. It's not pre-canned. It's all synthesized. And you need to do this, because if you're interacting with artificial intelligence, the computer is creating the content, not a person. Right? All the voices that we do, they're designed to be synthesized, so you can say any sentence, any sort of behavior. Emotions as well, they're all related to content. Now, in this case, she's kind of reacting with me. I'm going to sort of, hide from her over here, and I'll, I'll be quiet, and she'll start looking for me. So she's basically getting distressed because she's been abandoned. So she eventually starts crying. So she's got a virtual stress system which is being set off, but I'll show you more about that later. So I'm not going to be too cruel to her. It's like, hey, sweetheart, it's okay. Hey, hey, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, that's good. So now all of her movements are being generated and her fa facial muscle actions are being controlled. So let's take a, a look at these. So if we go in here, I'm now just going to make her skin a little bit transparent, and you start seeing her muscles. So let's zoom in here. And now these muscles are being driven live by neural networks. So we can actually, I can show you the activity of these different muscles. So if I pull on particular muscles here, you'll kind of see them, see them activate. So we can sort of do th different things, like, you know, scrunch your brows and things like that. And so all of these things are basically being driven. I'm driving them with sliders there, but essentially driven by neural networks. And if we go even, even deeper in, So she's got a full virtual body. So her brain is controlling her entire body, everything from her fingers to her toes. And so she's even got a, a little virtual heart, and she's breathing. Now, why do we even bother about things like a virtual heart and lungs for an artificial character? It's because they're tied, everything's integrated. Like the breathing of the character 
affects speech. You only speak when you breathe out. Your breathing rate changes when your emotional rate changes. All of these things are all interconnected. So we build these neural networks which are driving all the different components of the behavior. Now, her brain is also controlling her arms and all different types of reactions. So if let's go in again a bit deeper, and now we look at her brain model, and so you can see her nerves here. And we can go right into, let's take a look at the great brain model. So there's sort of default activity going on here. We can even look into the, the cortex and see different, so that looking at the brain stem here, so you'll see how as I'm moving around, you know, you've got the ocular motor nuclei, for example, driving eye movement. If let's, um, you might be able to see here if I make a loud noise, boom. No, it didn't work very well, but it's like, I think the microphone is down too low. So I just bump up this. Okay, boom. Okay, what you should have seen is basically the noradrenaline system kick in, that puts her into a higher vigilance mode. These are things which affect the overall behavior. Now, most AI work is done on like looking at a, like a little like network which might learn, whereas we're really looking at the system level. How do you take all these different types of neural networks and interconnect them? And so what our virtual nervous system does is it interconnects different types of neural networks. We build our own neural networks. We can also plug it into things like TensorFlow and other types of neural networks. So we basically can combine everything together into a sort of co cohesive whole. Now, if I um, just come back out of here and um, do a different, different view. So let's give her her skin back. Okay, so now, you can have quite a lot of fun with her. So I'm gonna, um, so how, now how do, how do we teach her? So we teach her through the way social learning, but we also can teach her through watching content. So I'm gonna um, basically, uh, let's put a, uh, a TV show on here for her to watch. So I'll play the, so she can watch. In the air, rock by your bed. Bears an hour sleep. So we can kind of see what she's looking Bears at. an hour sleep. So you can see over here, so she's watching the wiggles, and you see. Now everything that she's watching is going into her neural network, so if she's recognizing something, it's Everybody what she's phobiating on. And this is one of the ways in which we actually simplify the world. Everybody so when we pay attention to things, we've just reduced the dimensionality of what we're having to operate on. So if you have a neural network which is learning to interact with something, Everything is about dimensionality reduction. So we naturally do it in lots of different ways. And so the way that our approach to artificial intelligence is to try to figure out what it is that people do, why is it that we're so incredibly smart at doing everything and we can do things generally. So we're trying to build essentially a general system. Now, if I let it interact with content, so I'm now going to, um, I'll go to a different, different website. So it's, uh, um, She's all mellowed out now, so um, but I give it, I give her something. You, know, you can do dangerous stuff with baby X. So I can actually give her control over the mouse. So also, if anybody's got their credit card number and they want to give it to me, then um, she can probably purchase stuff online. So um, I just. Uh, so it's running live, so anything can happen. So you know, but it's no fun doing it any other way. So um, so. Here's a little piano keyboard, and now let's basically zoom out, and I'm going to actually give, start giving her control over the mouse. So, okay, and I'll show what the piano is like. She's getting upset, and now, but she's responding. If I show her pianos on a particular thing, hey, it's okay. So she's doing this autonomously and she's learning this is like reinforcement learning you do something something changes so she does a motor action the world changes this piano makes a sound and she gets roared now she's playing this all by herself it's, this is like a little tiny version of free will so you'll see what she's looking at in the keys now I can interact with her as well so if we're doing a, a shared symphony because this is such awesome music uh, she's actually clicked on another web page, so all kinds of. S <laughs> actually, oh, there's, she's clicked on a couple of web pages, and we're going to do the virtual. Now, watch. She's actually, she's got. So anything can actually happen now. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn her. So this is the dangerous thing. I've just t disabled her mouse, so she can click, but it's not going to actually do anything. And we can even do things like I can do um, a virtual drawing with her. So okay, so let's do a. Um, uh, 
space. And it's one of the other things we're looking at is like the notion of computational creativity. So it's like, how do we actually like do a thing where we're actually sharing a, a um, behavior? Like, say we're creating something. So then, you know, what an artist does is an artist does something on a canvas and then they see the reaction, but they've got something imagined which is kind of going on. And, and so um, I don't know what's going to happen here. This is always fun. Right, so um, let's give her a pen. Okay, and now let's give her control over the mouse again. And I might, if I draw something here, now she's going to just start drawing. Okay, so she's sketching. You can kind of see what she's doing. Now, oh, let's give her a, a, it's a thicker sort of thing. So now, actually, I can also encourage you going, oh, yeah, yeah, draw. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The drawing's really fun. So I'm actually encouraging her to draw something. So if she does something I like, then she gets sort of better and better at it. So this is an idea where she can actually start doing pictures. Now, if we, if we, we can even, like, basically get her to essentially learn a sequence so she can then start kind of learning pictures. So we're actually working at the moment on, on um, her virtual imagination, which is what you're going to see on the, on the, next, uh, the next sort of uh, version. So this is actually um, quite old baby X stuff that I'm showing you at the moment compared to what's coming up. So um, now the whole, the whole sort of point here is that, um, you know, we are trying to basically create essentially an autonomous learning system, which is learning actually from experience and, you know, basically it does something to the world, sees what the reaction is and learns from it. So it can learn by itself or you can teach it with it. And it can learn sequences of behaviour and it breaks down what's happening in the world into events, which are things that are going on and so forth. So now... This is, so this is, this is essentially, you know, we're trying to build really a teachable computer which you teach through social learning, just like we teach real children. Um, you know, it's all baby steps, it's really complicated stuff, but it actually is really fascinating stuff because you really have to think about, I mean, everything that we take for granted. Like if I, if I even just, for example, I'm going to, um, I'll give her a, a little, uh, let's give her a, uh, let's see, let's give her a, a little a virtual duck to, sort of track around. So now now her now if we take a look at the nervous system is actually controlling that. So she's actually generating all the movements to follow this virtual duck around. And so every part of her body is driven by neural networks and she's learnt by babbling. She randomly moves her hands around, she sees where the hand is and where the hand is going, she learns the most the sort of her, her brain is linking her her proprioceptive almost like the the angles of her body to, to, or the muscle activations to where a point is in space and she learns that association. So then when she sees something, she can activate that and reach for it. But what this does is when we create a virtual character, the virtual character can do anything. It can compose all types of different things driven by what it wants to do. So now all these characters, this is a baby, but when we apply this to an adult character, then the adult character can start to become trainable and we can put a voice on it. Obviously, you wouldn't want to wait 20 years to train an adult, so this is when we basically also work on connecting this to sort of current AI systems. And it's really the symbiosis of a sort of natural learning system, which has got its own memory models, interacting with a knowledge-based type AI system, so you could have Watson or Google, and you get this combination of these different effects. And really, what we're trying to do is essentially create the future of human-computer interaction. But anyway, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll leave this and uh, you know, move over to Greg, who'll talk about some of the sort of commercial applications that we're doing with this technology. So uh, thank you very much. I have an incredible job. I get to, to fly around the world, and literally I do it on a non-stop basis these days introducing people to the work that we do, the amazing research that Mark and his team is responsible for. Um, uh, and for most people, we're introducing them to digital humans or artificial humans, avatars for the very, very first time. No. Um, so I'm here to, today to talk a little bit about the business that we're creating around this incredible technology. Um, I met Mark just as, um, or just before the company spun out of the Auckland University, and, and you've just seen Baby X, and, and there's Rachel, one of our digital characters on the uh, on the background of that slide there. So often we get referred to as a uh, as an avatar company or a digital human company, but we actually 
like to think of ourselves as a company that is humanizing artificial intelligence. We live in a world over the next 10 years where we're going to spend more and more of our time interacting with machines and systems driven by artificial intelligence. We're going to spend more and more of our time talking to robots, talking to self-driving cars, talking to all sorts of forms of automated machinery. So we have, a, uh, so we approach, you know, the future with a, with a quite a simple view: Aren't these machines going to be more useful to us, more helpful to us, if they're actually more like us? So literally, what we're doing, you know, in terms of a business model, uh, in terms of a business concept, is putting a face on artificial intelligence. So, you know, you've seen uh, us talk about, and, and Mark introduced Baby X uh, as, you know, the research platform for our teachable autonomous artificial humans. Um, there are a couple of core technologies that we are packaging up and pulling together which enable us to create um, the business that we're creating. The first of these is what we refer to as digital DNA. Um, we've created, um, so far, eight digital humans. So we've got eight digital characters that we've created so far at this point in time. And as we move forward into the world, there will literally, into the future, there will literally be millions, tens of millions, and likely hundreds of millions of digital characters, digital humans created in the future. We may you know, well get to a, a, a place in the next five to 10 years where you'll be able to create a digital version of yourself. You'll be able to go out in the world and do stuff for you. Um, maybe stuff that you don't want to do, attend a lecture, you know, come and listen to people speak at a conference and report back to you. Um, but it's, you know, so one part of it is how we go about creating these digital humans. The second part of about it is how we actually bring them to life with a virtual nervous system. And you saw an amazing demonstration of Baby X and the neural networks, the brain models, the physiological embodiments that we're creating, which enable us to use this virtual nervous system to build digital, bring digital characters to life. So um, our... And the way we think about our, our AI and the way we think about robots, you know, is typically set by Hollywood and the science fiction movies, which are heavy on the fiction and a little less on the science. So most of us, you know, read the headlines, the robots are coming, they're going to replace us, they're going to steal our jobs, they're going to take over the world and they're going to kill us all. Um, that's kind of the popular view of artificial intelligence and the robots that we are starting to create. And we have a much more optimistic view of our future um, and in the way in which this technology can help us. We see what we're doing as a company sitting at the intersection of two really, really powerful things. And the first of those is the delivering incredibly personalized customer service, incredibly personalized customer experiences. And the second of those key points is the delivery of an incredibly specialized knowledge. So there's a rule that um, um, has become popular recently called Varian's rule. Um, Hal Varian, the chief economist from Google, is responsible for it. And he made a very, it's a very simple rule. It says you can predict what's going to happen in the future based on what wealthy people have today. So you stop and you think about that for a second. And you take any industry. Let me take banking as an example. If you're a rich person today, you get a personal banker. You get personalized service. You get access to specialized knowledge. That type of service, that type of knowledge is only available to the wealthy 1%. So we think of the technology that we're bringing to market, that we're commercializing, that our research guys are doing incredible stuff with, as actually bringing those personalized experiences and that specialized knowledge to everyone. Uh, imagine a world in the future where you, you know, each and every one of us could have our own personal banker, someone who we choose to interact with, um, somebody who knows us, somebody who's learned about our personality, the way we spend our money, the way we earn our money, the way we invest our money, and they can deliver very personalized interactions for us, incredibly um, specialized knowledge. 
You know, the only way a bank has been able to do that ever in their existence, if you go back to the 1950s and 60s, when we lived in a cash-based society, um, and, we, and some of you might remember that, uh, we, and we used to literally have to go into our local bank every single day to, to get money, to, to talk to our bankers. They knew, they knew their clientele personally, and they delivered a highly specialised service. So these are not types of services that big organisations have been able to deliver for a, for a very, very long time. We see a future where we can provide digital teachers for kids that don't have access to any teachers today. There's a global shortage of STEM teachers in our high schools. You know, already we're looking at use cases where we could provide digital tutors, you know, specialised science um, language. We can provide digital healthcare professionals to communities that don't have healthcare professionals. We've all read about Mangakino. You know, and despite them offering 400,000 bucks for a GP to move there, move there and live in their community and provide professional healthcare services, to the best of my knowledge, they still don't have one. So we're talking about you know, a lot of jobs, a lot of roles that humans don't do well, can't do well, don't want to do well, or we can't even afford to pay them to want to do it. Um, so we see a world in which... Uh, we can make a very, very big difference to the way people live. Um, we're very proud to be a New Zealand-based company. We're very proud to be doing some of the world's cutting-edge research in artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence you know, right here in New Zealand. We get to work um, and talk to some of the leading research firms in the world. Uh, our investors are some of the leading researchers in artificial intelligence in the platform. The two founders of DeepMind uh, are investing in, invest in, in us. Mark Zuckerberg, through um, his investment fund, Iconic, is an investor in our company, uh, as is um, Horizons, Horizons Ventures, who have been one of the leading inv investors in AI. That gives us access, you know, as a, you know, sm you know, a relatively small New Zealand company, um, to organisations, to researchers, all over the world. Uh, as an organisation, we've grown from a core team of 11. We're close to 70 people at this point in time. Incredibly proud of the fact that we have three of New Zealand's you know, top re uh, researchers in their field um, and professors in each of their respective fields working in our organisation. So the, the 17 PhDs we have working on this core technology, the fact that we have psychologists and neuroscientists um, as well as artists and software engineers and machine learning expert, experts working on our team. And obviously we're incredi incredibly proud of Mark's history and the work that he did to win you know, two Academy Awards working on you know, the state-of-the-art motion capture technology over 10 years ago today. We operate as a global company. Uh, we work primarily in very, very large offshore markets. We look at industries and, and the industries that we're focused on at the moment are industries that clearly get the fact that they face digital disruption. You, know, uh, you can go around the world, banking and finance chief executive officers know that in 10 years time their business is going to be completely different. And there's two approaches to that. You know, there's the head in the sand approach and there's the people that say we need to innovate, we need to experiment, we need to understand how we're going to change the way we interact with our customers because if we can't reinvent our customer experience, we're not going to be here. So you, you get the distribution curve. We're out there working with the world's leaders and innovators in each of these key industries and, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more Meet shortly. So there's not just the two components which I'm going to keep coming back to, the virtual nervous system, which is the way in which we create the behaviour of our digital humans, the digital DNA, which is the way we create them, but the fact that we build these digital characters in full 3D. They can go uh, now directly into AR and VR environments. We can project them using holographic um, projectors, so as the medium by which we interact with AI continues to change, the technology that we develop is going to continue to be right at the leading edge of this um, technology. Um, when I was talking to Michelle at the, at the beginning, we've been you know, very lucky. We've worked very hard to build a profile for ourselves on the international, uh, on the international stage with uh, 
um, with you know, coverage from organisations like Bloomberg, uh, Fast Company, um, Wired. These are magazines that we, we all know, we all follow, we all learn, learn, learn from. Uh, we recently announced some of our core partnerships um, with some of the most innovative companies in the world. Royal Bank of Scotland working directly with the Chief Executive, Executive Officer of, of Royal Bank of Scotland, an expat Kiwi by the name of Ross McEwen. You know, um, we got pretty much blanket coverage in the UK media when we announced our partnership and, and the work that we're doing with that. And, and you know, the reason I highlight that, it, it, it is because if you're going to work on the global stage, work with the most innovative companies, um, you're going to get profile, you're going to get that amplification of your message, which is going to help you accelerate your business um, and grow your business even even more quickly. So, you know, these are some of the top brands in the world that we're working with. Autodesk, um, you know, the, the top design, software design company in the world. Um, you know, there we're bringing um, Ava um, to life as their first digital employee, a customer service agent. Um, they wanted to be the first in the world to use, you know, a, a, a digital employee and customer service. Why? Um, because they are a 3D design company, they have to be at the leading edge of customer experience and, and, and customer uh, interface. Daimler Benz, um, we announced, they announced our partnership um, at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona um, um, at, the beginning of, um, at the beginning of this month. Um, um, and that's a really, really interesting partnership because if you think about it, you know, the car industry, the automotive industry, the manufacturers in that, are, in that industry are having to work out for the first time how they're going to build direct connections and direct relationships with their end customers. You know, their dealer networks, their distrib distribution networks, um, you know, are based on a, a wide range of different revenue streams, some of which are going to change dramatically as we switch from combustion engines to electric vehicles. You know, very, very simply, there's less moving parts. We're not going to need as many mechanics as we once had. Um, you know, so, you know, they're trying to look at not just how technology like this is going to um, drive their sales experience and their customer experience, but they're going all the way through to starting to think about you know, that self-driving car of the future. How are we going to build trust? How are we going to build a relationship between man and machine? Okay, well, you know, we've seen, you know, just in the last week, I mean, many people have assumed we're going to have self-driving cars, you know, on our roads in the next five to 10 years. But, you know, we saw what happened in Arizona um, last week, huge setback. I mean, not, you know, in many respects, surprising in many in many, many ways in terms of, you know, my personal views on that. Um, um, but we're, you know, so, you know, with guys like Dame Benz, they're wanting to explore how are you going to trust that car that's, you know, driving you down, you know, State Highway 1 at 100 kilometres per hour? How are you going to trust the car and know that it's seeing the person and driving erratically two cars back or the car that, or the dog that's running around on the freeway, you know, 100 yards down the track? Um, is a voice... You know, does a voice give us enough of a platform to build a relationship with something? You know, we don't think so. We think a face is going to be a very, very important part of that um, communication going forward. Um, we've always, you know, um, over the last 30, 40, 50 years, imagined our computers being uh, more human-like. Um, but, you know, most of our interface with our computers, you know, historically has been via a mouse, via a touch um, sensitive screen, you know, and we're just starting some of us to get used to the concept of, of voice assistance. Um, the way in which we communicate e with each other has changed dramatically um, as we've seen text messaging um, and video conferencing um, start to become an everyday part of, of life. And so one of the things we forget about when we communicate is the power of the human face. Now, um, this is a scene from a very important movie. Um, I'm going to flick to the next slide, and, and there's going to be a slight change, and I want to see if you figure out what that, that change is. So watch really, really carefully. Okay, one very, very minor change, not so subtle, I will agree. But it changed everything about that scene. It changed the context of the scene. 
It changed the, the relationship between the actors and the scene. It changed the relationship between you and the scene. Your emotional response to the scene changed completely. The way you felt about what you saw changed. Most of you laughed. And now you're, I've even screwed with your memories of this very, very important movie. Any time you see a movie from this franchise, you'll be looking for, when's Mr. Bean going to jump out? When's Mr. Bean going to jump out? So, I mean, this is a graphic in, uh, uh, illustration of how our, the human face is the most emo powerful emotional instrument that we have. It's the way we form relationships. It's the way we build trust. And in a world where we're working with artificial intelligence systems, big data, automated machines, robots, trust and relationships are going to be a very, very important part of the way in which we communicate. You know, you know we have this very, very, you know, use an analogy. We see, you know, our digital human technology being to today's voice assistants and chatbots what television was to radio and infinitely more engaging, interactive, and emotional experience. So as a company, we're looking to explore, you know, and, and, and you get a sense from some of the work that Mark's doing, some of the things he, he's talking about, how we're looking to explore the very, very edges of human consciousness and, and how we can create models that um, enable us to synthesize human behavior in a bunch of different ways. So, you know, Mark um, is an incredibly smart guy. So for somebody like me, I have to break it down into very, very simple words. You know, and so this is the way I describe um, the types or the component parts of the sorts of technology that we have at work here. Intelligent sensors in terms of the, visual, the, the visual and the audio systems. The brain models which enable the digital humans to respond in exactly the same way your brains respond. The virtual neurotransmitters that create the digital brain chemistry which um, create the emotions that we express, the, physio the detailed, incredibly detailed physiological embodiment of the work that we do. And if you've followed Mark's work for a while, you'll have seen that the biggest difference between the previous versions of Baby X and this particular version of Baby X is it now has a full motor control system. It now has arms and legs, fingers and toes. So we're you know, bringing it to life in even more important ways um, going forward into the future. So this is the world's you know, only virtual nervous system. We work with some of the biggest companies and the biggest research teams in the world in artificial intelligence. And you know, this is our view of the world. This science is, we believe, the only way in which you're going to be able to bring to life you know, truly autonomous, teachable, trainable digital characters. Um, it's going to become really, really important as AI and this world in which we live in continues to develop um, and their ability to interact with us, be trained to do things for us um, going forward into the future is going to become more and more and more imp important. Being able to react on the fly based on whether you're happy, whether you're upset, whether you're frustrated. Um, all of these things happen in real time. They're not things that can be you know, done by program content or replaying um, animated sequences and, you know, um, and trying to look at ways to optimize it. It has to be a synthesis of real time if it is going to be interesting, um, emotionally engaging and something that we're going to want to talk to and work with going forward. Um, with digital DNA, we are creating this population of digital humans and digital characters. Um, the use cases that we're working with are, are, are very, very broad. Um, we're working with one of the world's leading toy companies um, to bring uh, uh, one of the leading toy franchises to life. What does that mean? It's an app that exists on a smartphone. Your children will be able to download it. And they'll literally be able to have a conversation with their favorite toy. Um, you, as a parent, will be able to buy content um, to guide the conversations um, that your kids might want to have with their favorite toy. Um, and it, you know, the content you could buy could well be education content. So you know, their favorite toy becomes a platform for providing education in a fun, exciting, lifelike and engaging way. So the way we build these digital humans um, is going to continue to grow. It takes about, us about eight weeks to build a digital human today. 
Um, we're building out over the course of the next 12 months another 20, so we'll have a population of 30. Um, from that digital DNA that we capture from those 30 um, digital humans, we believe we'll literally be able to create just about any face in the world. Different age groups, men, women, um, different ethnicities um, are all parts of what we'll be able to create. It's kind of mind-blowing, this whole process actually, um, very intriguing. It's not my usual world and so it's kind of quite exciting for me. Just stir, angry with it. The team of people behind it, they put every inch of detail into everything. We want this to be the best. Yeah, I am nervous about meeting this digital human. It is going to be weird. It's going to be like, hi, and I, apparently I'm going to be able to talk to it and it'll respond and it's going to be very strange, <laughs> but exciting. So, um, most of you will have um, recognised um, that professional actress here in New Zealand, she's Sheila Takao. Um, Filthy Rich, I think, was the last show that um, she was on. Um, she now has a career as a digital human. Um, she's based, you know, uh, she is now the first, uh, you know, about to become the first digital employee for Autodesk. You know, we have created that using her likeness. We've had to license that likeness. You know, new jobs, new roles, new revenue streams for people. Um, um, in, in, in a way that is you know, quite amazing in, in different, different fields. There are three ways we're looking to em uh, employ this technology. So there's a lot of discussion about digital employees, digital assistants, digital customer service agents. Um, but we're looking further afield than that because this is not just about you know, customer service. Um, this is about creating companions. You know, I talked about the work we're doing with um, one of the, the world's one of the biggest toys companies to bring their, a toy franchise to life. You know, they become literally companions for your children. Um, you go to a place, you know, everywhere in the world we have a growing age population. Many of our age people, it's well known, you know, they are lonely. They do not have people to talk to. Um, there are a lot of work going on in Japan with robots providing, you know, companionships to elderly people. Um, but, you know, as we move forward into the future, you know, your fitness trainer could be digital. Um, your physics tutor could be digital. Um, you name it, you know, the opportunity to build a wide range of digital companions. And then we get into the world of our, of our heroes. You know, we're in the middle of creating um, some of the world's first digital celebrities um, so that, you know, we can have personal interactions with some of the most famous people in the world. So there are a number of different products, there are a number of different platforms that we're bringing to life. And what we're really looking to do here um, is create uh, this, you know, and what we refer to it as is a cognitive user experience. You know, something that will sit on top of artificial intelligence and will enable you to interact with these machines in an incredibly simple, intuitive and human-like way. It gives us the opportunity to transform customer experiences, making them highly personalized, democratize knowledge, providing the same type of specialized knowledge to all, deliver completely new brand experiences. Um, because for the first time, you can not only have a personal brand experience, you know, companies can measure and analyze those personal brand experiences. It's without a doubt creating a new user interface. We build these most amazing artificial humans. We saw in the video the process we go through scanning the face and the body to create them. Um, we also have to build their voices. Um, you know, digital humans may have to speak English in a Kiwi accent, an Australian accent, accent. Um, and there's not anything such as a generic American accent for those of us that have spent any time there. Do you want a New Jersey accent or do you want a California accent? Um, so our digital humans might speak with multiple versions of the same language or multi, multiple versions of different languages. Um, they are going to have different personalities. You know, a single digital human might have two personalities. The way, you know, the simple fact is the way I might speak to a 50-year-old professional um, services person, a 50-year-old professional lawyer, 
um, versus the way I would speak to a room full of 20-year-old kids, completely different. So a digital human is going to have to have the opportunity to have multiple personalities. Most of our customers are starting off by treating their first digital employees as, as, uh, as digital representations of their brand in the same way that they select a celebrity to front their TV commercials. But we believe that the world will quickly evolve past this and we'll end up with a world where you as the customer will decide who you want to be your interface and your companion, your assistant from any single organisation. Do you want to speak to a male or a female person? Do you want to speak to the same, a person as the same age as you, the same ethnicity of you, or do you want to speak them to an, an English, Spanish or, or Japanese? These are all options that can be provided in the way in which we personalise uh, these digital humans and the way in which we bring them to life um, in, different, um, in different areas. As a company, very, very strong international focus. This is world-leading technology. For us to stay at the forefront of what we do, we need to raise you know, significant sums of capital. The, the science that we're building here you know, is not funded in, you know, by a few hundred thousand dollars here or even a few million dollars. We're in the middle of you know, a very, very large Series B funding round at this point in time. So we have to be proving milestones, growth, you know, on the international stage with companies that our investors and in markets that our investors believe are relevant and are going to give us the opportunity to grow quickly. We're working with CEOs, uh, uh, CXOs, Chief Innovation Officers, Chief Digital Officers, who get the need they need to they need to be bold they need to be courageous they need to start innovating and experimenting with that technology now. Each and every single one of the customers we're working with want to be, you know, not want to be, need to be, are, you know, are powered by the fact that they have to be the first in their industry to experiment with this technology, to learn about this technology, to deploy this technology. Yes, it is leading edge. No, it is not for everybody today. Um, but I, you know, um, I guess the challenge I would throw out there is if you're not learning about artificial intelligence, you're not investing, you're not experimenting, you're not taking risks, you're not prepared to have some failures, there's a good chance your business will not be there in 10 years' time. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but I, you know, every bone in my body tells me that I'm right. Um, you have to start innovating and experimenting um, now. Um, so visionary leadership, courageous leadership is really, really important. Um, you cross a line when you start to deploy a digital employee for the first time. You go from the robots are coming to the robots are here. It's not like rolling out a new web page or a new iPhone app. Um, you actually have to have real conversations with employees, with unions, with stakeholders, with investors about why you're starting to use you know, digital employees in, in, your, in your workforce to deliver customer experience. And that does, now that takes a, a level of courage for a CEO to want to be the first in the industry uh, to do that. It's really, really important. So the questions I'll leave you with is who will be your first digital human, your first artificial human? You know, I have the most fun job in the world because I get to go around the world and make up stuff, make up shit. Um, with some incre incredibly creative people. Use cases, the, way, the things that we can do, the things that we imagine doing are driven by you know, the obvious, digital customer service agents, and crazy imagination. And here's some, some starters for 10. Uh, just signed a contract to bring um, a really, really famous person back to life. Digital reincarnation. The, our 20th century icons. They're all in their 70s and 80s now. They're not going to be with us for another 20, 30, 40 years. Um, we now have the technology to um, immortalize them digitally. Another way to carry their stories, um, their life's work, their inspiration forward into the future for different generations. Again, not for everybody, but it is something that is now possible. Um, inventing a new way so kids can uh, can interact with their the superstars of their favourite sport, whether it's football, whether it's basketball, whether it's rugby, or, or, or any one of any any other sports. Kids could interact directly with the most famous football player on, on, on the world stage. Um, they can ask him how he trains, 
which club he was his favourite club to work for, how he kicks um, penalty goals. Um, they can serve video content, they can sell merchandise, they can sell VIP experiences, they can provide whole new um, avenues for brand sponsorship. I mean, I'm just getting started in terms of creativity. Imagine what you can do for music um, and Hollywood celebrities um, in terms of, once again, creating personal connections with their fans. Um, um, any of, anybody of you who, who follows the messenger chatbot systems, you'll know, you'll, we may know, Selena Gomez has 300 million followers, you know, having text conversations with her chatbot. Now, imagine if you could put a face to that, a personality to that, which makes it a whole bunch, a whole bunch more intimate and engaging. Um, so these are just some of the, you know, crazy ideas that, you know, um, we look, we, we think about, and we, we work on as we as we travel around the world. And the really, really funny funny thing is, you know, each and every one of those we're either working on or in final negotiations to work on. Um, going forward. So what we're all about is delivering the exponential power of, I, um, of AI um, and looking at the ways we deliver personalised service and specialised knowledge to each and every one of you. Thank you very much.